Well, I'd like to welcome you all. Good morning um, to the event we're doing on 3D printing and environmental impacts. Um, my name is Dave Rejeski. I run the Science and Technology Innovation Program here at the Wilson Center. Joining me are Bob Olson, who's a senior fellow at the Institute for Alternative Futures, and Jay Pendergrass, who's a senior attorney at the Environmental Law Institute. Um, I'll just um, just briefly, we're going to do three, sh or two introductory shows. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the history of production. Do that in five minutes if I can do that, um, and turn it over to Bob. And Bob will essentially talk talk you through the article. The article's outside, and it, it was the cover story in the Environmental Forum about a month ago, I guess. Um, and and then Jay will make some comments on the sort of environmental implications from a, a legal and regulatory and governance side. Uh, so I'm going to start with just some some basic slides about is this a big deal when right? sort of people think about this and sort of here's our printer. And um, the thing that was st quite striking to me when, it, when I was building this is I used this. <laughs> right? Okay, and, and why, why is this important? I mean, I'll just kind of go through this quickly. Um, if we talk about the evolution of manufacturing, this was the, the basic tool, right? So people, if you go back to the first paradigm, it was craft. It was, people call it filing and fitting. Right? You just file stuff and hope it fit together, and if it didn't fit together, we'd file some more. Um, and, and that sort of evolved a little bit. So I'll just take you quickly through. The early craft system was about filing and fitting. Uh, the English got very good at that and fast at that by building jigs so you can actually take the part and say, I'm going to make something like this, and I'm going to file it and fit it until it looks like this. Um, you know, in the 19th century, there was a huge breakthrough called the American system of manufacturing. Uh, we just got very good at terms of making good machines like milling machines and also being able to measure very well. So that gave us interchangeable parts and that led to mass production. Um, early 1900s, we applied scientific management techniques to mass production, uh, a la Frederick Taylor. Uh, so we were focusing largely on how we organized the work. Uh, we started using statistical process controls, started hooking computers up to production machinery and then use computers and flexible manufacturing. So that's a rough uh, sort of quick tour through the manufacturing paradigms. The important thing to think about is every time there's a paradigm shift, labor productivity went up by a factor of three to four. So this is a huge, huge gain. Right? All of a sudden, these, these paradigms left, sort of got, got us to a point where you know, we were producing a lot more things uh, for society with about the same labor. So these are huge sort of step changes as we go across a number of centuries. Um, so we were just cha we're changing tools, we we're changing process controls, and we we're also changing how we organize humans and the interface of all these three things. And I think that's important to think about. It wasn't just the people, it wasn't the tools, it was how we control the tools and also how we interface with human beings. Um, and that'll have some implications for 3D printing. Uh, so this is what it was about. I mean, I, I tried to reduce this into some quick bullets. You know, it was greater precision, higher speeds, lower costs. Right? So we had this capacity for what I call reproducible precision. Um, and now it's moving into other areas like biology, uh, where we can actually engineer organisms that do things that we want them to do. And we don't have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. So some of the, the important shifts, um, one was analog to digital control. I mean, people, people talk about digital fabrication. We've had digital fabrication for decades. I mean, as soon as we had these huge computers with vacuum tubes, we started hooking them to machines. A lot of that happened in the military sector initially. Um, I think the big shift that we're looking at, and these, these were, I would say, largely um, machines that took stuff away. Right? So they lathes, millers, drills. I mean, they, you started with some block of metal, plastic, whatever, wood, and you're, you're taking stuff away from it. You're milling, you're drilling, you're routing. Um, you know, the shift we're going to talk about today is subtractive to additive, which I think is a pretty significant shift. So we're actually building things up from the bottom. Uh, it's not new. And I, I was, this is an early 3D printer in 1984. Um, this is a, a, a 3D printed object I was given um, at MIT in 1989, right? And it's been sitting on my bookshelf, and it's a very interesting reminder of just how slow things are, right? And I've made a, a complete idiot out of myself for years by telling people, you know, the three-dimensional printing revolution is right around the corner. 
and it wasn't right. And and I got I finally got an email from someone at Yale who said, I remember you saying this, you know, 12 years ago. I thought you were crazy, but it's an interesting thing. I mean, this has actually been been around for quite a while. Uh, the machines were were kind of ponderous; they were difficult to program, but all of a sudden, you know, things have become fairly easy. So, but I, I, again, the thing I want to emphasize is things don't happen immediately. They might appear that they're happening immediately in terms of the way the press covers them, uh, but there's almost always a long history there, and quite often it's quite invisible, either because it's happening at universities or it's happening in the military sector. We just don't we don't see it. So. Um, Prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. Uh, we just put up a bunch of predictions about you know, this market. And uh, you know, we've dealt with emerging technologies for about a decade now, nanotech, synthetic bio. And whenever something comes out, it, you, you have this flood of predictions. You know, this is a disruptive technology. It's going to change the world. The markets are going to grow 10 times faster in two years. Um, and they all look pretty much the same. I mean, you sort of have this <laughs> battle of the predictions going on. And, and here you see some of them have come out of various think tanks and, and reports that you have to pay a lot of money for. Um, the one in the bottom I think is interesting. You know, the third in industrial revolution potential of 3D printing is overdone, uh, given the uncertain growth potential in the consumer market, limited uh, pragmatic applications. So there's there's always these you know these, these kinds of projections about mass mass impacts, disruptive technologies, you know, it's going to change everything. And then there's a bunch of people that make money by saying, no, no, it's not going to happen. So you have to wade through all of those. And we spent a lot of time trying to do that. Um, so how big are the markets? These are just some of the, the projections on global market growth for 3D printers. Uh, could be up to 8 billion by 2020, 2022. Um, the interesting thing to ask is, OK, is this a big deal compared to the market for global machines? Right. So the market for global machine tools is last year, it was 94 billion. Um, and most of those machine tools are, are subtractive. Yeah. But this gives you some sense of, I mean, it's not insignificant what, what we're talking about. Uh, but it's, it's, it's still a fairly small, small piece of the, the machine tool market. Um, and the other way of looking at this is, it's not just the value of this. What's the value of what this makes? Right which I think is important to think about. Um, so this just looks at um, you know, the, 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 the uh, market of actual parts coming out of 3D printers. And, and the big ones are going to be in aerospace, medicine, electronics. Uh, that little sliver at the top, which gets all the attention, is actually consumer products, or consumer printers. So you've got a lot more of these coming out. I mean, I can go to Staples now and buy one for about uh, $1,100, and it's going to drop considerably. Um, but in terms of actual value added to the economy, where you may see a lot of changes actually in other areas that are, I would say, semi-invisible right now. Uh, we've been doing a documentary film on, on additive uh, manufacturing, and we've been going around and talking to people that are making you know, turbine blades and prosthetic devices. And, and I think these are the things that are really going to be game changers. Um, so I think one of the, the things that uh, people forget about, and, and to me, the thing that is really revolutionary potentially about is is, is sort of our ability to do rapid prototyping. So, um, inside the innovation cycles, people call it the design, build, test system. So, I design something, I build it, I test it, and sometimes it fails, and I go back. Uh, I worked for a number of years as an industrial designer, and this was my nightmare. I mean, I was able to sketch ideas incredibly fast, and then I spent weeks in in the model shop trying to build things. And some people innovate through three-dimensional objects. Right? Um, Edwin Land, who developed the Polaroid camera, never, never used sketches. Steve Jobs was a touchy-feely guy. He went in and talked to his ID folks all the time. He wanted to see things. And so I think the, the innovation impacts might be even more subtle in the sense that we actually can innovate in three dimensions and test things out. And some people do that very, very well. They're not good at sketching or going from sketches to three-dimensional objects. So I think the idea that this is going to change the innovation cycle is quite profound. And this is where you're beginning to see this. You know, even kids are being uh, given the potential of prototyping their next generation of tools uh, and uh, earphones and bicycle, bicycle parts. So some people estimated that you know, this is about 80 or 90 percent of the use right now. It's just rapid prototyping. Um, so what are what other things are going on? Well, you know, medical applications are a prime example simply because we have lots of digital images. 
you know, we're always slicing and dicing our bodies up with CAT scans and MRIs. Uh, so this is actually a woman at the bottom whose jaw was completely shattered in an accident. Um, and they went in and basically um, did a digital image of the side that were rem remained. Your body is perfectly symmetrical, but we're able to do a three-dimensional print uh, of the jaw replacement. Uh, we did some filming. Um, oops, whoa. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Um, we did some filming at a children's hospital of uh, pediatric surgeons that, that actually were getting ready to go in and operate on a newborn's heart, and they printed the heart out. Um, so they were actually able to begin to look at what this, what the heart would look like when they opened the child up. So I, I, you know, we'll see prosthetic devices. Uh, we'll see you know people developing you know different. This is a heart valve uh, that's been scanned. Uh, People are building um, rotor blades for jet planes, hard to imagine. So you can 3D print titanium. Uh, and the way it's done is just with an electron beam welder. Same principle comes in at 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, hits titanium, and just deposits the pieces. And so you're building up. So it's, you, you need to think about this as more as just, it's not just plastic stuff. When we begin to be, be able to actually print ceramics and, and titanium objects, um, it's, it's, it's quite a game changer. And this is actually done in a vacuum. People are playing around with car bodies, fuselages for planes, furniture. This is a very large 3D printer at the top. So also stop thinking about these things as little tabletop devices where we're just printing out very small things. Um, somebody mentioned dresses, you know, art, fashion. Artists are always er you know, early adapters of this. Um, so these are people that are beginning to do jewelry. Um, so I think you're, you see, the interesting thing is the penetration is in lots of sectors. So you're getting a lot of innovation driven by 3D printers in all kinds of sectors. Uh, the chefs love this. Right? I mean, we, you know, we can actually load this thing up with Nutella. Uh, you know, anything that has the right viscosity, you can print, right? Uh, so you, know, you can print fairly complicated uh, edibles with these 3D printers. Um, so don't be surprised if you go into a restaurant and you know, somebody sort of says, do you, do you want your, your face printed out? <laughs> uh, it's possible to do it. I actually have a small app in my iPhone that, that I just take a bunch of photos of my face or any object and it'll stitch them together into a three-dimensional model for me. So you know, the, you know, the server could come up and actually do your face, you know, print it out in salmon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Um, the other thing to think about is this is not, it's not just about additive replacing subtractive, right? It, it, this is a, a device that, is, I don't know how they got this through the x-ray machine downstairs, but uh, <clears throat> somebody at MIT brought it to me, uh, and it basically is a pop-up fabrication system, but um, it's a fairly, it's a computer control just like this, you know, it can move at X, Y, and Z axis, uh, but the heads change. Uh, so you can put a milling head on it and take things away, or you can put a 3D printing head on it and build stuff up. So I think the, in, the important thing is to not to think about this as just, okay, it's going to be, you know, we're going to have substitution. It never just, this never works that way. So the, the synergies between the two might be quite profound. Uh, and people are already thinking about machines that do both of those. Um, biotech. Um, this is an interesting idea, still in the idea we, we do a lot of work on synthetic bio, but this is something at Imperial College where um, essentially it's ways to print. So you don't put plastic in, you put junk, you put refuse in. Uh, the refuse goes into a, a bioreactor. Uh, they've engineered some organisms. So what comes out is essentially recyclable plastic that is then printed. Right? So the, the input is no longer just plastic, it's actually junk and waste. So we're going through two processes, the first one being biological, the second one being uh, an additive manufacturing process. So that's a quick introduction. Um, so you know, we've been thinking and working in this area for a number of years, and we sort of said, OK, what are the environmental uh, energy impacts of this? And I, I think the, the thing that, that got us involved was that w there was just a lot of claims rolling around. And people would say, well, you know, it's, the subtractive is going to produce less waste seems, most of these uh, on the surface seem logical. Uh, you know, I'm not taking something and, and basically taking things away from it, I'm building it up. Um, you know, subtractive could reduce, I mean, additive manufacturing could reduce carbon footprint. I can actually print where I need something or manufacture where I need something. Uh, big implications for military logistics and that sort of thing. So 
Um, if I'm the, the Maytag repair washer guy, I don't need a huge inventory. I just need a digital pattern for the part. Uh, and I can actually print it out if somebody asks for, oh, I've got a washing machine that's 10 years old. Why should I keep that in stock? Um, so there, there are some interesting things. And there's also this issue of uh, are we going to do the same thing we did with paper and just start printing a lot of this stuff? Um, so I, th I think the, the thing that was interesting, there's certainly a lot of claims out there. And we spent months asking, is there any research to back this <laughs> right. up? Uh, I mean, we, we, Bob is working for months. We had a, a mechanical engineering student from the University of Virginia here just scouring um, the recent peer-reviewed literature, gray literature, anything we could find that says, okay, has anybody really looked at this? Has anyone sort of asked questions beyond, wow, this intuitively seems or anecdotally seems like it would work this way? Um, and so I think one of the interesting things we're trying to do is to sort of just stimulate more research. Uh, so we can ask and answer these questions now early before we have lots of these out there. So I will turn it over to Bob. Bob will take you kind of through the thought process in the article um, and kind of what we dug up after uh, probably about five months of research. There you go. Let's see. We need to change the... Uh... Ah, okay. Is this on? Yeah, well, well Dave's... Well, while Dave's trying to work that out, uh, uh, the uh, l l let me just just say how much I appreciate uh, uh, what Dave has done, not just in sponsoring this work, but in the work that he's been doing uh, over several years, looking at emerging technologies and trying to help people think about, you know, how can these technologies contribute to sustainability? What kinds of dangers uh, or unintended impacts do they pose, and how can we head those off? Uh, an approach very different than what's often happened in environmental protection, where you know you it's a situ often a situation where problems have to become serious and widespread, and then it's a it's a expensive and uh, difficult effort to back the problems down. So much better to try to see them early and deal with them early, and that's certainly the case here with uh, with three D printing. As Dave said, it's been around for a long time. It's been mainly used for rapid prototyping, but now we seem to be at a at a possible breakout point where on the one hand you see printers becoming so inexpensive down in the price of, of PCs that that people can own them all over the place. At the at the other end of the spectrum, industrial printers have become so good that they're going beyond doing prototyping to producing final parts. So it re really does look like a situation where where the use is going to expand. A big part of the question of environmental impacts is how big it will be, and I think I pretty much agree with everything Dave was saying about that. Uh, I t let me give you a little different cut at uh, some of the applications. Uh, just thinking about where 3D printing is especially good, maybe better than other manufacturing uh, processes, so that these are the areas where it will really take off. One is complexity. Uh, this is a, just an art object. But you can't imagine this being done by milling away from a solid block of plastic or, or a mold being made that this could be produced from. Only 3D printing can do something this complex. And there are many real world applications for the ability to do complexity. Just as an example, uh, Boeing produces uh, environmental control piping for, for its aircraft, for its 787 for example, and they used to have to manufacture about 20 different parts and then assemble them together to get a unit of this environmental control piping. Now they print it as a single piece and it's stronger and lighter than it was before. So the ability to do complexity is really important. Another area where they excel is in small variations uh, on a basic design. Uh, there are already, a, this is a good example, there are already about 10 million uh, in-the-ear hearing aids like this. They're custom fitted with a soft material uh, and then they're 3D printed uh, to be a complete custom fit. The shells are printed and the electronics is inside. Uh, other things, Dave talked about uh, dental, uh, the dental area. Uh, temporary crowns, retainers, things like that, that are small variations on a theme. 3D printing is great for that. Short-run manufacturing, uh, where you 
you know, other manufacturing methods may become cheaper as you, as you produce a lot, but if you're just producing a little, 3D printing can be excellent. Uh, this, is a, this is a company called uh, Freedom of Creation that creates uh, uh, limited runs of lighting, of jewelry, of uh, trays, of, uh, but in every case they can sell it for more because it's a limited edition, uh, only a small run of the, of the object. Um, one of a kind objects uh, 3D printing is ideal for. This is a, a picture from uh, work at the Mayo Clinic uh, just this year uh, where, where they're working on a hip replacement. Uh, they have a scan of the patient's hip. Uh, they, from that scan, they can create a model of the hip, and then the manufacturer that's uh, making the hip joint sees exactly what it has to do to make that joint uh, and can, can uh, conform it to any uh, you know, small difference in size from the standard parts they used to have or, or any abnormalities. So perfect fit for, uh, uh, for medical parts like that. Uh, they've talked about bioprinting. Here's another example of fairly simple bioprinting, just printing skin. Uh, the, uh, the way it's done is that there's something called biopaper. It's come to be called biopaper. That's really just a, a, a gel that dissolves over time and you put droplets of what's come to be called bio-ink, which is thousands of skin cells, uh, onto the biopaper. Uh, the droplets spread, touch each other, form a tissue. The biopaper dissolves after a while, and you get a, uh, a thin layer of skin uh, for something like a, a burn victim. Uh, I think this is going to be a major area of, uh, of development. Uh, producing products when and where needed. Here's the ultimate example. Uh, the, uh, the International Space Station uh, is going to have a, a printer specially designed to work in zero gravity. Uh, this isn't in the space station. This is in that thing that's called the Vomit Comet, where the, the plane goes up and, and as it heads down, you get about 20 seconds of zero G and they're testing out the printer. Uh, but there are you know, lots of applications of this uh, for, for more daily life. And there are, there are libraries forming. The biggest one is called Thingiverse where you can go and see all sorts of things, that were bits of software that you can use to print things. And some of it's just uh, uh, you know, toys and gizmos, but some of it is very useful things, like this is some of the parts that, uh, uh, that IKEA uses in assembling furniture, and you run out of parts, and you know, how do I get this thing put together? And you go and print out, uh, print out a couple parts. And then there's hobby printing, where you just uh, People are buying these inexpensive printers like this one. <laughs> uh, this one was probably a little too inexpensive. It didn't work very well. Uh, and uh, just have fun with it. But here we begin to see the limits of 3D printing, too. That little Yoda object there takes a couple hours to print. It's not something like paper coming out of your paper printer at home. And uh, it's very sobering when you really look at this. Uh, this is uh, uh, Carl Bass, uh, the, the president of Autodesk. Autodesk makes uh, uh, CAD software and software for 3D printing. So he really knows what he's talking about. And he's formulated this thing called the, the uh, third power law of 3D printing. Uh, and if you look at what he says there, it's very sobering. Uh, it means that 3D printing is not going to replace a lot of the traditional manufacturing processes that can produce things very fast and produce things in large number. 3D printing is going to fit into those kinds of areas that I just went through that it's best for uh, and will grow in those areas, but some of these images uh, uh, of 3D printing just taking over and making everything obsolete uh, is just not going to be the case. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, the fact that small printers uh, are becoming available for a couple hundred dollars or a couple thousand dollars has led to the impression that 3D printing can be cheap. But if you want to print a titanium aircraft part, <laughs> you're talking about printers that are much more expensive. So 3D printers range over a huge uh, uh, span of, uh, of costs. Now, if you really want to, want to get a handle on the environmental impacts of 
these areas that are, that are liable to come up with 3D printing. What you'd really like to have is good life cycle analyses that, did, that looked at everything from you know, the, the, the resources needed to, to build the printers in the first place and, and the, the materials used in the printers all the way to the, to the uh, disposal at the end. And uh, I looked and looked, and there was almost nothing like this. And toward the end of, uh, of writing that article, uh, something appeared from uh, work at, uh, at the engineering, uh, mechanical engineering department at Berkeley that looked at, at that list of, uh, of characteristics with three printers. <clears throat> Let me pull this around so I can see it. The, the, the first printer is, uh, is like this one. It's the kind of, it's called an FDM printer. It, uh, it extrudes melted plastic through, uh, through hot noz heated nozzles. Uh, and builds things up layer by layer with the plastic. The one in the middle is actually a computer-controlled milling machine, a small computer-controlled milling machine, the other type of manufacturing technology on a very small scale. And the third one down below is, is another type of 3D printer uh, called an inkjet printer that uses a, a, a polymeric ink that is spread out and then dried by ultraviolet light. And they, so they did an analysis of these things <clears throat> running full tilt, just kind of running constantly. And th that was the order that, that they came to in terms of their total environmental impacts, that the, that the FDM printer with extruding plastic had the least impact. The milling machine was next. The other type of inkjet 3D printer was much worse. It was worse in, in the energy it used. It was, <clears throat> it was worse in the materials it wasted. Uh, and they found it was very important to evaluate it with these machines kind of constantly running because the, the, uh, that first one that uses uh, extruding plastic would have been worse if it had been being used intermittently where it had to heat up again and then go down and then heat up again and go down. Uh, it's much more cost effective if you're continuously able to run parts. And so th that led them to a, a very important conclusion that, it, that to some extent, uh, it's not even a matter of which technology you're using, it's a matter of how you're using it. Uh, that to have the fewest number of machines running the most jobs uh, resulted in the least environmental impacts. So that job shops uh, really make sense from, a, from an environmental point of view. Now, let me go through the kind of claims that Dave was talking about and what we found as we looked at them. Do they, do they waste less material? Well, some do. Those FDM printers that, uh, that print with plastic uh, are all, can, can be almost waste-free. Uh, in practice, the cheaper ones don't always do a very good job and, and people fooling around with them may run multiple prints to try to get the best one. And if you're building very complex things, you may have to use little support structures to hold parts of it up as it's printing, and that becomes waste. But, but that's not necessarily a problem. And in principle, those FDM printers can be very low waste. Uh, I could go in at some depth to more industrial printers, but the, the basic thing there is that there is a fair amount of waste in, in much of the industrial printing technology, both with plastics uh, and with metals. And it has to do with, uh, in many cases, with your heating material that's in a bed, uh, and some of it becomes the object that you're trying to create, but some of it is, it's, is structurally affected by that heat, and so it doesn't work as well as virgin material. Uh, so you can recycle some of it, but not too much of it, or it'll spoil the next object you're creating. So there's always a little waste uh, with each build. So it's not clear here whether 3D printers are, uh, you know, are, are less wasteful. Some, some are good, some aren't so good, some, some are not bad, some are pretty bad. Are they more energy efficient? Well, here the range of different types of 3D printers is just uh, enormous. Uh, if you're going to print uh, titanium aircraft parts, you're using a machine that uses hundreds of times more energy uh, for its powerful uh, laser beams uh, than uh, traditional manufacturing processes. Uh, so some 3D printers are pretty energy efficient, some are extremely energy inefficient, yet they can do things uh, that 
uh, can't be done as well otherwise. But you can't make sweeping generalizations that, uh, that 3D printing is, is more energy efficient. Do they reduce transportation energy use? Well, as Dave said, when you first think about it, you know, both traditional manufacturing and 3D printing do involve the shipment of materials. But then if you're printing at the point of use or near the point of use, then you're avoiding some transportation uh, uh, energy uh, use. But it's not so simple. Now, if you're, w when you're doing things out of a big production facility, the shipments to it are, uh, are in bulk. If you have printers scattered in homes uh, all around the country, you're doing shipments to lots of, to thousands and thousands of stores and maybe to homes. And is it really using less energy for transportation? It's not clear. Nobody has done the kinds of studies that could determine this yet. So it's possible that 3D printers, uh, uh, on the whole, use somewhat less energy for transportation, but it's not, it's not clear, and uh, we need more work. On recycling, uh, there, there is the potential to do recycling very well. Uh, one of the, the, the plastic that's used most often in 3D printers is, uh, is recycles very well. Very well. Uh, the, the other printer, the, the other plastic that's most often used is actually biodegradable. Uh, we're beginning to see the emergence of machines like, like this Philobot machine, where you can uh, take objects you've, you've made, uh, you take your waste plastic and grinds it up, melts it, and turns it back into spools of plastic again. Or you can even take other waste plastic like uh, milk bottle jugs and cut it up a bit and put it into the machine and it'll turn it into plastic on your spool for you. Uh, so there's the potential for actual home recycling of materials. And some of the major manufacturers like 3D Systems and Stratasys at the, at the industrial level uh, are providing services that recycle these spools and cartridges and, uh, uh, and other materials and even the printers themselves. So how well recycling is done is largely a matter of the care that the users take to take advantage of the opportunities for, uh, for recycling. Uh, but there's a unique issue here, and that's the ability with 3D printing to create objects that combine materials. Now, we can't yet combine things as different as metal and plastic, that where the, the melting temperature difference is thousands of degrees. Uh, but uh, you can have different kinds of plastics. In, like in some industrial object, you may have points where it needs to be very strong, and so you have a stronger plastic. And in other parts, you can use a less expensive uh, plastic that's not as strong. So you're, but, but they're all welded together. So you can't separate them, uh, which poses a unique problem for, uh, for recycling. Since uh, 3D printers are going to be used in, in a lot of non-regulated environments, uh, in homes, in, uh, in small businesses. Uh, they're beginning to appear in, in libraries now, uh, where libraries set up little fab centers that people can come in and, and use fairly decent quality 3D printers. It's really important to think about toxicity. Uh, and just during the course of doing the article, uh, a, uh, a piece appeared uh, by researchers at the Illinois Institute of Technology that was a first of a kind look at the f fine uh, particle emissions uh, from, uh, from this kind of printer, the, uh, the FDM type uh, printer, and uh, found that they could really be characterized as high emitters. Uh, and that depending on the plastic you used, it varied a lot. If you use that kind of uh, PLA plastic that can be recycled, the emissions uh, of fine particles are an order of magnitude higher uh, than if you use uh, uh, ABS plastic. Uh, so they, they compared the health hazard uh, of using printers like that in a, in a fairly unventilated environment to smoking cigarettes in the same environment. So it's not disastrously poisonous, but it's not good for you either. And there have been many reports of people using 3D printers in, in fairly closed spaces where uh, where there's dizziness or headaches or, uh, or nausea. Uh, so it is an issue. Uh, with industrial printers, uh, a number of the materials used are, are well-known uh, 
uh, materials and they're well characterized and have to be used with care. Some of the newer materials, like the fine metal powders, I couldn't find any uh, uh, health safety data sheets on them yet. Uh, but whenever you're using fine powders, there's really issues of, uh, uh, of uh, problems uh, breathing them or, uh, or even uh, uh, little powder explosions being possible. Uh, so there are some real toxicity issues around 3D printing. This question of where will things be made, well, Dave's, Dave's chart showed that the, the, large, the large industrial setting is where the vast majority of expenditure is going to be. But, the, but it's possible that, uh, uh, that there will be really be a, a breakout of, these, of the use of these small-scale printers. It won't add up to nearly so much in terms of money, but it could be lots of printers uh, uh, in homes and uh, small businesses and libraries and so forth. And then there's a third alternative. Uh, you can think of it as the Kinko's alternative. Uh, Kinko's didn't replace big printing shops that do magazines and books and things like that. It didn't replace people's home printers, but it found a big niche in between where people want high quality printing uh, done quickly, uh, you know, better than their home machines can do, doing things that their home machines can't do. And so that may be true for, for 3D printing too, that, uh, that there's a niche there that's fairly big. Uh, I added uh, UPS on, onto, the, onto the image because UPS is actually beginning an experiment putting some 3D printers in some of their stores uh, to see if anybody uh, you know, takes them up on it and, uh, and uses it. And then that question of whether we will overprint. This is, this is a really fascinating one because some of the real enthusiasts for 3D printing have argued that it could actually be a tool for really moving towards sustainability, uh, that there are ways to use them uh, that will reduce environmental impacts and reduce consumption in general. Uh, that idea of just printing things when needed so that you don't overproduce things and you don't have to spend uh, money and, uh, and energy uh, uh, in warehousing things. Uh, replacement parts being easily available so that you can keep that old washing machine uh, or other equipment going uh, when, when otherwise parts not, may not be available. Uh, or just the easy access to parts making it more likely that you'll repair things rather than throw them out. Uh, the idea of upcycling things, of actually being able to uh, you know, take some older things and uh, with 3D printers uh, add functionality or melt them down and make something else out of them. It's a pretty advanced concept, but uh, there are some opportunities for that. And then just the idea that with 3D printing, you can customize what you make to, you know, to what the user wants uh, or what the user needs. And it's less likely that you'll throw out something that's really been, you know, that, that you said, this is just what I want. So that's a line of argument about how 3D printing really could take us in a more sustainable direction. The other possible direction is that it's so easy to print stuff out uh, and uh, uh, that uh, people will just have you know, kind of a throwaway mentality, instant gratification, print, uh, print things just at the whim of it, lots of trivial knickknacks, uh, and, and print multiple drafts of things, you know how in school, printing your term papers, or those of you who write now, you know, doing papers, you often we print multiple drafts of things. Well, it can be the same with 3D printing. You, you, no, this isn't quite what I want, and do another draft, and no, this isn't quite what I want. So which way will things go here is, uh, is a very important question. I have to tell you that in looking at uh, Thingiverse and some of these online computer libraries and the things that are there, uh, it looks to me like things are tipping toward the wasteful consumption uh, level, but, but this is a cultural issue. It's, uh, it's not exactly a technological issue. This obviously is a govern governance challenge. At the, uh, at the industrial level, a lot of our existing uh, uh, regulatory structure will apply and it won't be so difficult. But what about 
homes, libraries, small businesses, all these unregulated environments. It's a whole new challenge we haven't had to uh, think about before. Our, our regulatory structure is kind of set up and built around the idea of regulating large centralized organizations, not, uh, not households. It seems to me that the single best way that, uh, uh, that EPA, uh, which is probably the, the agency most involved here, most potentially involved, could deal with this is through a program that they have that's called Design for the Environment. And the thought is that, that the decisions that usually have the most important impact on environmental uh, consequences are, are decisions that are made early in the design process. And if you can affect decisions at that early design process, uh, it may be the most effective way. And so popularizing a, a framework for thinking about how we should approach 3D printing, uh, perhaps through EPA, perhaps through the companies that make the printers, through other, other government sources, uh, just trying to put this kind of framework into people's minds uh, that at the level of production of 3D printers themselves, uh, you try to have energy efficient, uh, environmentally benign production processes, uh, uh, that you design the printers themselves to uh, be energy efficient and, and efficient in, in the use of uh, materials, uh, that you, uh, in the materials used in the printers and, and new materials are being developed over time, uh, you really try to, do, to uh, focus on the development of materials that are recyclable or biodegradable when possible, made out of renewable resources, um, that the materials you use and the printers themselves are designed to really minimize the, uh, the, those kinds of problems that, we, that I talked about of, of, of fine particle emissions and other health hazards, uh, that the companies involved uh, in making printers really step up to uh, recycling, being willing to take back uh, the printers themselves uh, and, uh, and foster other kinds of recycling programs. And that there be, just be a lot of information that's provided to people uh, who get 3D printers about how to use them in an energy and material efficient way, uh, how to minimize the, the health risks uh, from using them, uh, and maybe trying to influence attitudes about, uh, you know, toward sustainable or a, a more green approach to 3D printing instead of that uh, wasteful uh, throwaway approach. Now, I've, I've expressed uh, a view similar to Dave's that there will be a, a number of niches where 3D printing will grow and it'll be important, but that it's not going to be as huge as many people have, uh, have portrayed it to be. I think it's been overhyped. But I, <clears throat> I could be wrong, especially over time uh, in the decades ahead as the technology continues to progress. And we've, we've seen many situations where you get uh, uh, an, an early over-enthusiasm for something, which I think is where, we're, where we are with 3D printing right now. And then you get a, uh, uh, a period of disillusionment. Things just didn't happen as fast as, uh, as you know, the, the hype uh, portrayed it. But then after a while, the technology improves sufficiently so that uh, the real revolution happens. It's possible that 3D printing will be bigger than what Dave and I have, uh, have portrayed. If that's the case, those govern governance issues become all the more critical. Uh, so with that thought, let's talk about governance. All right, so I'm gonna hand it over to Jay. We, oh. the, the, the idea is to, to sort of get a sense of the existing environmental laws and could they handle this. I mean, the other thing I just wanna throw out there because uh, we have a bunch of people on the web, is if you've got questions, because we're after this uh, comment, we're going to go into Q&A, uh, you can tweet them to us. Uh, the, the tag is just at STIP Idea Lab, S-T-I-P, and then Idea Lab, one word. So feel free, if you're watching this, to uh, tweet some questions. We'll collect them, and, and when we go to Q&As, we'll, uh, we'll put some of those up. So, Jay? And the, uh, I start with the, the general... Uh, conclusion that the uh, laws that we have, uh, the environmental laws, uh, pollution control laws, uh, cover 3D printing. Um, but the, the real question is um, how they will be applied to it. And um, as Bob said, to the extent that you're talking about 
uh, 3D printing in the industrial applications. Um, I think they're, they're already being applied and there's nothing particularly um, new or different um, because um, our pollution control laws um, generally deal with the waste end of things. Um, Bob went through the life cycle analysis and we, um, we have often tried to suggest that a life cycle view of environmental law might be the better way to go um, looking at the, you know, the life cycle of things of when do you start with a resource and, and uh, take it through the manufacturing and use process to waste disposal. But we focus on, in our pollution control laws, on the waste and the air emissions, the water uh, emissions and disposal of waste. Um, so in the industrial settings, um, these machines are being used in places that um, generally are already regulated to the extent that they have uh, significant air emissions. Um, those are going to come under um, existing permits. Um, it really matters as to what the um, emissions are. Um, and we, we regulate by specific uh, chemicals. So it's, you know, the feedstock and what um, is then uh, uh, thrown off um, during the manufacturing process. But all of that um, is not uh, determined by the process itself. Um, so, you know, I think that by and large, uh, air, water, and, and waste um, laws at the um, industrial level um, are already being applied and, and uh, people uh, are just using it as they have in the past. The, um, where this becomes uh, potentially more problematic for the uh, pollution control laws is um, when you're talking about the, the job shop um, where you're using 3D printers more in a commercial setting um, where they're um, not that large industrial. Um, and there, um, you know, many of the, uh, the FedEx or the UPS um, offices um, don't currently see themselves as regulated entities under uh, many of the en environmental laws. Um, and uh, this might not put them into that universe, but it might create some um, of the waste issues that, uh, you know, haven't um, been foreseen. Um, in the commercial setting, you know, the water um, is likely to be uh, discharged into a um, municipal wastewater treatment plant. Um, whether that would create anything um, new um, issues for those uh, treatment plants, uh, again, would depend on what the substance that um, they're using as feedstock and what, uh, what wastes are created. <clears throat> From what uh, we're seeing so far and what um, Dave and Bob have talked about, probably not going to create uh, significant problems um, there. Um, and again, the disposal of the, of the solid waste, um, unless you're talking about more exotic uh, materials, um, the plastics um, are probably not going to be considered hazardous waste. They'll be solid waste. Um, it may just add to the volume going into our um, landfills. And then when you get to the uh, household level, um, we generally don't have any regulation at the household level. Um, and um, most of this is going to be um, disposed of um, with your municipal, municipal uh, trash. Um, so if, if it's the overconsumption um, route, then, you know, maybe it'll add uh, to the uh, uh, amount of waste in landfills, but if, uh, if it goes the other way, um, then maybe it'll uh, help to reduce the load because we aren't throwing away as, as many things. Um, the 
the potential issue about the um, air emissions is one that um, is probably of more concern at that uh, commercial level and the and the home level, um, and that's where we don't regulate, and yet um, people could end up uh, having uh, significant exposures. Um, and I don't think there's much chance that um, we're going to regulate um, at those levels. So um, the things that Bob talked about in terms of design for the environment and trying to assure that the products are, uh, that the printers themselves are made to a standard that reduces um, the air emissions um, and then education um, to people about uh, how to use them uh, to avoid the uh, the uh, particle-filled room instead of the smoke-filled room. Um, but as I said, the uh, I think the regulatory environment um, is currently set up that it will uh, can uh, deal with these. They're a new technology, but um, because our regulations are um, aimed at the substances, they potentially cover it. Um, it's, uh, it's really a question of where you're doing this as to whether um, there'll be significant um, issues that arise. Okay, just, um, we, we actually did a back of the envelope calculation of Botech. Um, we just had, we actually uh, sort of asked the question, what happens if you had 40 million printers in households and people were printing out a bunch of stuff and you, you ended up throwing out about 100 grand, this is 100, about 100 grams of plastic a week, um, and you end up with about 100,000 metric tons of additional waste, I think a year or something like that. Um, but we, we throw a lot of plastic out. It's like 33, 34 million tons a year. Um, so this adds about 0.3%. Uh, and that's under you know fairly high penetration rates. So I mean you can go through the calculation. I, I think the issue is more you know can we avoid even that because we really are throwing a lot out. And also the issue of what happens if we have hazardous materials. When we we, we were using epoxy in this machine, and so when we took the epoxy out and actually loaded it in, it was quite a vol. I mean there's a bunch of volatile hydrocarbons it's in nasty. there. Yeah. Um, we actually had a material safety handling sheet that came with the epoxies. Um, so they were essentially OSHA regulated. Uh, so again, it depends a little bit, not on the machine, but kind of what's going into the machine. Uh, and in some cases like this, which is kind of material agnostic, as long as I can get it to go through the nozzle, I could put a lot of strange things in there. Uh, so I think there, there's a whole bunch of open questions, but I think you know, just, just looking at the sheer mass of solid waste, uh, we tried to convince ourselves uh, it would be great to do less, but it's not gonna, even in the really extreme scenarios, probably wouldn't add much. Um, I think we're going to just do questions. We got a mic somewhere, right? Yeah. Why don't we just, uh, yeah, right here. Uh, just uh, tell us who you are. And I'm Dale Desette. I'm uh, uh, executive director of the Science of Information Institute here in Washington. Um, the thing that I think of is something very different than you're talking about. Um, I could, uh, using the more advanced machines reproduce um, objects um, that are uh, um, <clears throat> that have high value and uh, uh, could be patented or whatever. I could reproduce them by the thousands and I could blow that patent out of the out of water in three seconds. Uh, I could reproduce that machine uh, that you got there uh, and produce a thousand of those and then those thousand could produce something probably in one day and, and start manufacturing in, in a single day. High value things. Not only uh, patented things but artistic things. Uh, I, I would like to hear you discuss that aspect. <laughs> well, that's a legal angle and a technical angle. Uh, 
I think one of the things that, I mean, there, there is a tension in the community. So at one level you have, we see this, we, we do a lot of work in, in uh, biology also. Uh, there's this tendency of, of openness and sharing. You know, people are just putting this stuff up online. But eventually, as soon as somebody wants to make money out of it, um, you know, there's a, there's a tendency to want to grab intellectual property, especially if you're trying to attract venture capital or any kind of investments. Um, so I think there's this constant tension. Um, and you're going to see this. We saw this with, with music, right? Uh, we started putting music up online. We, and all of a sudden, you know, people tried to figure out, how do I make, a, how do I make money out of, out of sort of digital rights, essentially? Um, so I think that you're right. I mean, I think the IP issues here are, are enormous. Uh, and it might be that, you know, the artists start uh, trying to, you know, copyright some of their stuff or protect it, which becomes difficult and onerous. Uh, right now, there's this kind of uh, ha almost hacker mentality in the community. Of people are just sharing stuff. Um, but I don't know how long that's going to last. So I think there's a, you know, it's a real question about, you know, what happens if I start reproducing? Or, in fact, if it's a patent-protected thing, what happens if I re reproduce it with a slight variation? Right? Because that's how we give patents out. You know, we basically say, okay, uh, I'm going to go to the patent office convinced they're going to pull out everything that looks similar. And my, 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 my job as a patent lawyer is to convince that office that this is a little bit different than any other patent. So th the other interesting thing is our ability to do sort of small customizations on existing patented objects um, and open up patent potentials. So I think that, I mean, the whole IP thing, I agree completely. I mean, it's a, it's a huge area. Uh, I will say, though, that, you know, that's an area where our, our, our laws have been around for, you know, since the beginning of the country. Um, it's a strong area of law, um, and um, people, because there is the, uh, the potential for um, making money, the, the holders of the patents are uh, generally aggressive in protecting them. Um, it will take a while um, for this to shake out in terms of, of people finding um, those that they think are infringing on their patents. But they do that, and they've got you know a strong uh, set of, of uh, IP lawyers um, out there that will pursue them, and so um, there will be, um, I think, a series of uh, disputes about whether there is infringement or not. Um, but that's a well-settled um, area of the law in terms of what you have to show. Um, to demonstrate that your patent is indeed valid and whether it's been infringed, and you know, getting through getting your patent through the um, PTO is one thing, but being able to defend it um, in court um, is another. Um, but yeah, there'll be a shakeout. Here's a here's a newspaper article from two weeks ago. Smithsonian leads the way in 3D images of artifacts. Uh, which means that you could print copies of the artifacts. Uh, it's harder for me to imagine being able to produce things that you couldn't tell weren't the original, uh, that were made out of exactly the material of the original. Uh, but you could get a great business selling things that were, you know, to the eye looked like uh, these artifacts. And uh, did you have a right to do that? Uh, could you actually do that without uh, negotiating with the Smithsonian? Uh, it does raise interesting issues. Yeah, I think we've actually figured out some new job categories in terms of for, for IP lawyers and, and forgery experts. Yeah, we're in the back. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Roger Cochetti. I'm with RJC Associates, and we work with internet e-commerce companies. I have a question about the technology and and through it the economics and social impact of the of the whole thing. Uh, anybody who's used 3D printing now understands that it's it, it takes hours to make a copy so that it really is suitable for industrial design, exotic niche markets, or people who just have a lot of money to spend and want to have fun. <clears throat> the, one of the keys, the, I think as somebody pointed out, the key is bringing the cost of the device down and the, the timing of the copying um, down. Bringing the cost of the device down, it's probably a matter of just mass production. I mean, it's just motors and tubes and stuff like that. So it doesn't have to cost $3,000, the uh, material made in Taiwan, you know, could, could come down quite a lot. But the timing, I think, is a big issue. And 
And, and that really is my question about the technology. I'm not an engineer, but even I know that there are epoxies which will uh, dry when you expose them to ultraviolet light. And there are th most of this time is because it takes time for the layer to dry and the motor to sort of swing around and, and come back. What, 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 for anyone on the panel, what, what are the prospects within the next several years of seeing 3D printers which can complete a complex task in minutes using some technology that may already be on the shelf in military or other uses, but just, just hasn't been applied yet. And if that were to happen, if you could get a 3D copy in minutes instead of hours, how would you expect that to affect the market? Thanks. Yeah, I'll say a little. Uh, you, you've identified really the, what, what is the key physical limit for a lot of 3D printing, you know, how long it takes a layer of plastic to dry before you can apply the next layer. Uh, so it's not like home printers or office printers that have enormously speeded up over time. There are physical limits here uh, that uh, are more difficult to overcome. I haven't seen any really interesting technical proposals about radical speed ups. Uh, I, I don't know if, if Dave has. Uh, so this this may I, mean, I, I would expect some improvement, but I haven't seen anything indicating the possibility of radical improvement. Yeah, and I, I think yeah, I've I've done some work with with U, UV stabilized um, things just for making prototypes, and and it does speed things up a little bit. Um, and I think the, some of the metal powder work might be interesting to look also in terms of speed. Um, but I think the, I, I think the, this ability of, you know, complexity being almost free here. I mean, it's just, that's to me, uh, sort of, it's, it, it's compared to what, <laughs> you know, it's just some of these objects are so hard to make in any, any other alternative mode that you're even, you're looking at either not being able to make them or you're looking at days and days. Right, so even if it takes a while to get it out, uh, it's still relative to you know the normal kind of prototyping process uh, that I've been involved in when I was doing industrial design. It's still it's a huge, huge speed up, just in terms of the ability to actually create a three complex three dimensional object quickly. Yeah. Prices are certainly going to come down. Uh, I think you're right that mass production is, is bringing down these you know the the cheaper plastic uh, printers that we see now have gone from uh, tens of thousands to under a thousand. Uh, and uh, just saw an article the other day about metal printers coming out uh, that are much less expensive than they were. That wouldn't be used in homes, I think, because they're talking about thousands of degrees there. But uh, in small businesses and other settings, I think the, some of the metal printers may become much cheaper too. And they can be faster uh, than the plastic printers. I mean, the other the other possibility would be creating designs that are optimized for subtractive and additive simultaneously. Right? So, I mean, milling machines are fast. I mean, we know how to do this really quickly, uh, and so don't use additive when you can do subtractive quickly. Uh, so, one can imagine a multi-head machine that's basically optimized to use the fastest possible um, sort of. Uh, methodology for whatever and switching things around. So I'm actually going to, I need, I need, I need, I'm going to do some uh, drilling, routing, and milling to do something and then do some additive on top of that. I haven't seen a lot of that, but certainly I'm sure engineers could figure this out. That suitcase in your slide was the closest thing I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Right here. Uh, Jim Sang, two technical questions related to speed. One, um, how parallel are, how many channels or how many nozzles can you get on a print head commercially right now? Um, and also, how small um, are the uh, nozzles? Traditionally, of course, you make the droplets smaller and smaller, and you worry about heat loss. So presumably, if your nozzles now are on, on a micron scale and you went onto the submicron scale, you could uh, cool much faster. And I said, if you go from 24 nozzles on a head to a million nozzles, presumably you're, <laughs> you're, you're parallel processing it. <laughs> what are the limits right now on these technologies? I mean, I, I just saw a 3D printer um, that was uh, submicron. Uh, so certainly, you know, you're getting down to very... So it was, I think, 500 nanometers or something. I mean, it was very small. Um, and I, I think the this, you know, this one, I could have gotten a double head one. I don't know if there's... 
I don't know what what people are playing around with yeah. in terms of, of actual you know heads or nozzles. I mean, right now, I mean that's you can get three or four. You... Yeah, all, all of the, uh, the 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 machines that are selling in the couple thousand dollar range are, are just a small number of heads. I don't know if there's an intermediate level that uh, that will be coming or not. At a million dollar level, what kind of stuff is that? <laughs> Uh, they, they don't they don't use that same technology at a million dollars it's uh it's it's lasers and things like that yeah they, it, it's possible that that will come but i haven't seen anything like that yet yeah way in the back hi um david goldston from nrdc two questions um one uh, on quality control, does it, it make it harder, easier? I mean, if you've got things like wondering if the different layers have solidified right and so forth. So just on, on pro not home doesn't matter so much, but on commercial products, certainly aircraft issues, um, does it create, complicate quality control and testing or not? And then <clears throat> on the energy efficiency, um, is this something that the companies making these are looking at? Is this something where you talked a lot about EPA and others, but is this something you could do work, look at through DOE appliance standards, Energy Star for home use, that kind of thing? Yeah, want to take a shot at that? Huh? <laughs> well, certainly on the the energy side, um, yes, you you think this would be a um, you know potential for at least the Energy Star program, but that then is you know, voluntary in the sense of, you know, getting the manufacturers to improve the energy efficiency of um, their machines, um, whether you um, could then take it to the um, mandatory side with the energy efficiency, that's just, uh, um, you know, a matter of, of uh, getting the uh, law and regulations in place, and I'm not sure that, it, it, you'd, I think you'd have to have a lot greater market penetration before people would think that that was worth doing. Um, but the Energy Star program would improve the efficiency. Yeah, in terms of the quality, I mean, I think one of the things um, that people run, run into, and we, Aaron was out filming somebody in Chicago that was making turbine blades for new stealth fighters. Uh, it's, it's also just the, the sort of the, the tendency of large institutions to say, well, you never made it this way. Right. All right. It, it might, it's, you know, I mean, we have a history of that and we have military specs and we always make things the same way. So, I mean, one, one of the things is it, I think people will run into is it, it is a radically different way of making it. Um, so, you know, they may have to say, okay, we're going to change the press test protocols. Do we have to double test this? We, you know, how are we going to actually deal with this? Because you've completely shifted around the things that we always saw and we always bought it this way. Right. Uh, and that kind of let's buy it this way has become actually institutionalized in a lot of the ways we, at least the Defense Department, a lot of other other institutions buy things. So if I come and say, okay, here's here's one I've done additively, people say, what? You know, what? Well, maybe so from I. From a technical point of view, does it really mean that you need a better or worse? No, I think. Quality? Well, I mean, Aaron, you want you you actually talk to these guys, right? And they want turbine blade guys, right? They certainly don't seem to think that it would be any any. Um, you know, less quality parts than, than uh, traditionally made. I think, as Dave was saying, their biggest concern, the biggest obstacle so far is the validation of the parts. And that's one thing that um, on the, the voluntary um, systems, I mean, particularly with aircraft, um, but, you know, most manufacturers um, have a quality management system um, and the, the aircraft manufacturers um, have their own um, specialized um, quality management system that is based on ISO 9001, but um, in addition, and um, I, this would still come within that. Um, their quality, uh, uh, the management of quality would uh, continue to have to um, meet those standards and any, there's a strong uh, customer, i.e., aircraft, uh, the user of the parts, um, uh, they have a strong system of, of feedback and requiring uh, any quality issues to be dealt with. Yep, right here. 
Uh, let's get you a mic, so because you're way up in the front here. So. Um, Ed Haptor, U.S. Army Research Lab. In terms of the uh, uh, software, have you seen any development in terms of um, optimizing the software to reduce the energy consumption or the materials usage? Not a, not in the software realm. I think that's more in the talk to Autodesk, right? I mean, you talk to some of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's more in the machine design and uh, and materials uh, design rather than the software itself. The software basically, you know, takes a scan of an object or uh, uh, or a three D image and and just breaks it into into tiny little slices uh, that uh, inform the machine how to spread it out. Um, uh, you know, making those slices thinner or thicker might have an effect on how fast uh, things go, but I, I don't think. They affect the environment that much, but it's worth yeah, thinking yeah. about. I yeah, mean, I it, think is. it is. It is an interesting area to sort of ask the question: is Is could you do something with the algorithms? That it's not you're, you're optimi optimizing both the hardware yeah, and the software. Absolutely. Yeah. Up right here. Hi, I'm Jeremy Matthews with uh, Physics Today magazine. Uh, with respect to the use of this technology in niche areas, say in research labs, in businesses, and not in the home, how does one go about regulating a turnkey type technology? I'm just curious as to how that goes about, or is there any regulation on a technology that's used for niche, non-mass production purposes? How do you research that? Right. Well, um, the universities um, get somewhat special treatment on some of the laws, um, but the uh, the turnkey kind of idea, um, the the laws and regulations apply to them. Um, it um, we generally have, um, you know, some of the rules are based on uh, quantities. Um, so, you know, if you're dealing with hazardous um, substances, then, um, you know, production of hazardous waste is based on different levels of how much you produce in a month um, that, you know, they, they may well come in as uh, small quantity generators and, uh, you know, have limited regulations. Uh, the water and air rules, um, would apply, but um, they, depending on how much or where they are, um, you know, they may not, in fact, need to get permits. Or, um, particularly for the water, it's likely to um, be something where um, they're discharging into the municipal um, sewer system, and they have to deal with whatever municipality and their potential pretreatment rules. Joe, you want Joe Greenblatt, Environmental Protection Agency. Um, I think the uh, emissions and discharges to the um, external environment are fairly well covered. Um, I'm more interested in the uh, internal environment and whether the OSHA rules would cover these. Um, and whether OSHA has the capability to actually uh, um, regulate at such a massive scale the uh, potential for you know, mom and pop operations to pop up all over the place. That's a significant issue. OSHA is um, a small agency, um, tiny in comparison to EPA. Um, and I think, uh, Bob, you talked about the number yeah. um, of inspectors. It's uh, um, you know, while well, OSHA itself may have a couple thousand inspectors, it is also a program that is delegable to the states. Um, the last I heard, there were around 20, 22 states that um, had delegated programs, so that expands um, the number. But um, then OSHA has um, traditionally been limited um, in not um, inspecting uh, facilities with 10 or uh, fewer employees. 
um, the the rules may apply, but um, OSHA itself uh, has restrictions on who it can inspect. And the fact is that there are um, you know millions of workplaces um, in the U.S. Um, and they don't get to um, all of them. So um, the the rules may apply, but um, whether there is uh, you know, the monitoring and enforcement is um, a significant question that seems highly unlikely that uh, job shops um, are going to be visited. Um, when then the question is, do they know about um, the rules um, to the extent that they are receiving materials um, that are covered, they should be receiving a, a material safety data sheet. Um, and so at least they could be informed about that. Um, that will tell them about proper handling. Um, but that's uh, an area um, that's you know a weakness, um, not just for this technology, but a weakness in our uh, health and safety implementation of the health and safety laws. You know, I've sometimes wondered just about the places like Kinko's with uh, all those large copy machines op operating pretty continuously, does that create a somewhat hazardous indoor environment? I don't know. And then is it is, is regulated in any effective way? Well, they're, they're regulated. I mean, to the extent that you have a large um, company, um, then you know, their environments are regulated. Um, you know, to the extent that you've got franchise systems, then again, they might come into the uh, small workplace. Following up, yeah. Hi, my name is Caroline Spruill, and I'm with the World Bank Institute. Um, I'm just curious if, in your research, any of you have come across anyone who's doing any thinking about applications of this technology for development. Um, in terms of super, you know, hyper local in time production, let's say to repair damaged infrastructure or improve upon it. Just curious uh, if you know of anyone who's who's doing that sort of work. I I have seen articles about that. I can't remember right now, you know, what organization was involved, but but there is some activity along that line. Yeah, I mean, one of the models that. You could look at them I as mean, the Fab Lab model, which you know, MIT is kind of propagated around the world, which is not, it, it, you can use 3D printing, but essentially it's a desktop factory. Um, and those have been delivered into a lot of develop, developing countries and, and basically, you know, people manufacture what they need. Uh, so in India, one of the things they manufactured was a, a very simple device to tune up uh, engines for irrigation pumps. Uh, the things would go out of tune, they couldn't start them, they used up a lot of extra fuel, and so those were actually manufactured right on site uh, and, and given away actually to a lot of the farmers. Uh, so I, I think there's the, the model generally of being able to take uh, sophisticated production tools that could include this type of thing or, or laser cutters and bring them in to uh, an area and train people. Uh, along with the Fab Lab, there was always a, a, someone that came in to do training so it wasn't just dropped in and hope somebody would use it. Uh, the idea was to drive the design and production around local needs, uh, but also to train a group of people to, to know how to use the machines. Uh, so I think the model is there, um, and there's no reason that the 3D printers couldn't be added to that suite of, there's a fab lab actually here in, in DC, uh, and they, they have a 3D printer and they have all kinds of other laser cutters and, and machines that, that people can come in and use. So the potential's there, the model's there. Um, this would just become one machine that was added to other machines that you can actually put on a desktop and train people to use to, to meet you know, needs on site. Mm -hmm. The advantage of this, obviously, is you, you know, again, you can deliver the, 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 the instructions, production instructions digitally. So anyone that's hooked to the internet can kind of share these things across an area, even if it's on satellite phones or cell phones or internet kiosks. Yeah, Don. Yeah. 
uh, <clears throat> Donald Barnes, South China University of Technology. Uh, I was looking at this graph you've left up on the screen and getting back to Dave's introductory comments about the length of time it takes for these things to come in. Uh, I and probably some people in this room are old enough to remember Dick Tracy's uh, watch radio and so on. And as little kids, we dreamed about that. Uh, then the mobile phone came in and so on. But at some point, I don't think the curve ever went down to zero in disillusionment. I think it maybe it decreased. But then sometime in the past decade or two, it just took off. Uh, and in the world today, there are as many mobile devices as there are people in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, nearly, that, that's almost the case. Uh, at, and part of that was the link between the mobile phone and the internet. Do you envision a way in which 3D printing would go through a similar second uh, acceleration when it became connected to the internet in some way? Mm -hmm. Be my guest. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it, it, it is essentially, I mean, it is connected to the internet. And since, you know, as Bob said, you have the, I wouldn't call it the iTunes of things, but the Napster of things where you can just download stuff. So um, you have this massive digital sharing system where people are designing things, say, here's a 3D model to print this, putting it up there, you download it. Um, so I, I think this is inherently... Um, it's kind of, you know, people call it bits to atoms machine, right? You know, I, you know, I can take the bits, create atoms out of them, translate the atoms back into bits, share them with somebody else. Um, at what point it takes off? I mean, I, I think it's very, I mean, we spend a lot of time just thinking through, you know, is this likely to end up in sort of be like a computer printer, right? I mean, that's one analogy, right? Um, um, the other analogy I use was, is it likely to be like a drill press? Right? So that, you know, if I'm, if I have a shop, you know, I want one of these in there next to my table saw. Um, and I, it, 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 you know, it, and so I think the, the kind of the penetration model, is it a consumer good where everybody wants one that's connected to the computer? Uh, or is it say kind of in, in this niche where it's, you know, sophisticated hobbyists that want this and it's just part of the suite of things I have on my desk. I think it's really hard to figure that out. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I mean, if you could do that, um, uh, we could be very rich. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of figuring out, it's, if you look at a lot of those technology penetration curves classically of, um, you know, the television, the radio and stuff, you know, they sort of start out like this and we're down at here, we're, we're at the elbow. Uh, and then they sort of shoot up and some of them are, uh, they actually flatten out, right? Um, because they, they reach a saturation point or they're actually, there's another technology that replaces them. <laughs> Um, so I, I sort of, I actually had one slide I didn't show of kind of where we are on that penetration curve and it's down in this kind of elbow where it's starting to go up uh, and whether it continues to go up, whether it flattens out, whether it goes, we actually drew a bunch of these scenarios, uh, but it's, yeah, it's that problem with prediction. Yeah. And it may be that totally other technologies come along to do something closer to what you're talking about, uh, maybe a nano production technologies or something like that. Uh, 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 we may get to the Star Trek uh, uh, box that you can program for anything at some point. Uh, it's possible. You know, adding on to that, oh, I'm Bill Raleigh, uh, Institute for Alternative Futures. Um, the turntable on my microwave oven broke last week. You know, it was a little plastic piece. And being an old engineer, there was no way I was going to go spend, you know, flail and a lot of money to get something. So, you know, the uh, uh, magic glue and everything, put it together, and the first time it didn't work. So then I wrapped it with string and all this other stuff, <laughs> and it works. But these days, everything I do is on my computer. I either go to apple.com, you know, at the Apple store, or I go to Amazon. And I can imagine a time where we've got some kind of scanning device at home. And every time something breaks, every time we need something new, whatever it is, we will gather enough information and we will just go online to the, the Apple store or something. And a day later, they'll send it to us. So I've got the technology to define what I need you know, some very simple process. 
And then there's the, the online store that will create anything like that that I need because, you know, my guess is if I wanted to buy this little plastic piece, I probably can't even buy it. I'd have to buy a new microwave oven. So I, I, I could see that really catching on. <laughs> I bought that same piece a couple of years ago. <laughs> Best Buy's online store. <laughs> yeah, no, you can imagine a store of, of things. We're against obsolescence, right? And it's a store that just specializes in, in problems like that one, you know. There's a bunch of smart people, and they're designing. designing. That's got a patent, so if somebody is making them, because I used to have gag wires, and the, the door handles were notorious for breaking this little piece of pop metal. Yeah. But you couldn't get the piece of pop metal. You had to buy a whole door handle. So this, to make a little piece of pop metal out of plastic, <laughs> Just during the past couple of months, I came across an article that talked about uh, a, uh, a digital camera device, and maybe this is similar to the software you were describing, taking your headshots, <laughs> where, where you can uh, take pictures of an object and it creates the, uh, the CAD uh, software for it, which then you could use in your 3D printer to print it out. Uh, so that's, that's uh, not out of the question at all. So microwave owners and people who have old Jaguars are, you know, more likely first adapters. Yeah. Old Jaguars are hopeless. I have a quick question related not uh, not to the uh, the materials you're talking about, but to the uh, uh, tests that use the measure its efficacy. Uh, Energy Star has been mentioned as a as a standard. Uh, but any of us who have read the national press within the last three years know that the Energy Star program pretty much ran off the tracks. And uh, you had the Lake Wobegon effect where 80 or 90 percent of the products in a category all carried the Energy Star label. So it seems to me that one of the real issues as we have technological change is to make sure that our, our testing materials, our testing standards have integrity. Uh, and is this is this something that we are we need to put more time to effort to and uh, are we able to do that? A question has been raised about uh, fake parts in aircraft industry. Uh, assertion was made that there were standards uh, for that. But if you read any of the technical press, you, you realize that it's a it's a continuing problem in the military and in the aircraft industry mm -hmm. to to try to uh, keep out fake parts. Uh, so uh, there, there's a back there's a, a a back piece in the supply chain that also needs attention. It seems to me, and I'd be interested in your comments. Yeah, I think the statisticians call it a regression towards the mean. Right? We just after a while, we just uh, everything becomes, as you say, Lake Lake Wobegon. Uh, I I think the interesting thing. I don't know whether. Um, one would have to assume that you had a base. I don't think we even have a baseline for you know energy consumption. No. Uh, so it'd be hard to. I think that would be one of the beginning things is sort of to, to take a bunch of these and test them and say what's the what's the you know what's the energy baseline. Um, you, you'd have to figure out what's in the system and what do you count and what isn't. So this is acrylic plastic, um, and so there it, it costs actually some. There's embedded energy in that. Do we count that? Are we just going to count the, because I could put a, a, essentially a watt meter on this and get a sense of what the step motors use. Uh, but I think the first thing is, is developing some kind of baseline uh, for what, you know, what, do these, what do these 3D printers use? What could they use theoretically? Uh, what would constitute a star, right? I mean, that was kind of the issue you're getting at. Um, and I don't think anyone has even done that yet. No. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Dave Rabinowitz. Uh, first, to comment, uh, the fact that most products are now carrying the Energy Star label is a sign of the success of the program, not the failure, because when the Energy Star standards were established, most products did not meet them. The fact that most products do meet them means that it was very successful. But my question is about standards. Right now, if you want to buy an e-book, you buy the format that fits whatever e-reader you happen to have. Uh, is that the case with 3D printers, or is there an industry-wide standard that's either in place or being developed so that everybody can develop one file which will work on any printer? There, I know there are many different files now, okay. so uh, I don't know what standardization efforts may be going on. Any idea? 
Well, I mean, we, we had real problems with this because, you know, we had all kinds of files coming in in different formats and, you know, they couldn't be read. Uh, we, we, we tend to use a lot of Macintosh. There was nothing for Macs, so we had to switch to PC computers. Um, you know, I, I think people under underestimate the need for software standards in terms of propagating technology. Uh, I mean, 10, 10 or 12 years ago, we started doing a lot of work on, on mesh networks, you know, just these small kind of, you know, these small little combine you know wireless transmitters and sensors that you can put out there and um i was convinced this this was going to just take off uh, because it seemed like such a great idea and i remember talking to one of the people that um got some of the initial darpa money to do these work and you know, 10 years later he'd actually started up a firm and i said what took what took it a decade and he said coming up with standards so that these these actual things could communicate with one another yeah. So, I mean, you raise an in incredibly good point. It's quite often what, what keeps the technology, because of this, the fact that this is partially digital, uh, what keeps it from propagating is the fact that you've got all these people developing different software packages. Uh, so this was very difficult. There, were, there weren't a lot of standards here. Mm -hmm. And so I think st the software standards, so you've got, okay, I know this one. It runs on everything. Uh, it comes through all the browsers, whatever. It works on every platform, and it'll drive all the printers out there. I mean, just think about the paper printers, what a nightmare it is, and having to download drivers and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, software standards would be great. Yeah. My, my name is Jared Riddick. I'm from Army Research Laboratory. And um, I was sitting here, and I was thinking a lot about standards um, because uh, some of the conversation... Uh, you were discussing folks making uh, turbines for jet engines, and the issue of validation came up. And, um, you know, interacting with the, the standards community from our side, we're a research laboratory. We're doing fundamental research to support uh, new technologies in, in this uh, arena. And the standards community is only now sort of uh, beginning to form up. Uh, there are some committees within ASTM, um, the American Welding Society as well. And... Um, so the, the, the development of standards is sort of at a beginning phase for the production side. But to me, this hearing what you're saying here about standards for energy efficiency, it sort of seems to me to present an opportunity um, for the two uh, sort of standards communities to interact. Particularly from, from our side, I think that um, in developing standards that we would use for validation, there's rarely any mention of sustainability or energy efficiency. And I think that um, a goal might not be to necessarily write a standard for energy efficiency of 3D printers or 3D printing processes, but to place within the standard some mention, at least, mm -hmm. of how to handle or address sustainability or energy efficiency. And that way, when you have that in the standard, it becomes a part of the certification that folks do when they're learning to actually use these in a production environment or in the research environment when we're teaching um, folks, you know, how to use the machine, you know, sustainability, efficiency, energy efficiency is mentioned. But the point you make about establishing a baseline, I think, is really going to be important because when we talk about processes, when we're making something that's complex, there may not be another process to actually make this thing that's you know not so cost prohibitive we wouldn't approach doing it. So now how do we say it's more efficient? Because more efficient than what? There is no other process. <clears throat> I think those are the areas where 3D printing is really gonna have an impact where it really is addressing a need that can't be addressed in any other way. So then how do you start to make comparisons against you know what would be a, a probably a difficult to establish baseline? So I guess, in the end, I, uh, I would sum it up by saying that the standards community on our side, the production and research side, is only now beginning to address some of these issues. And I think it's a, a golden opportunity, really, to introduce that sustainability conversation into what will be a paradigm shift in a way that wasn't possible you know, in decades and centuries past. You, um, you mentioned the standards community, but that, I think, raises the, the issue of where where do the standards come from? And yes, there are the various, um, you know, organizations that oversee the process. But the there needs to be a demand for standards, and that has to come from uh, 
the the manufacturers, industry, and users. Um, and so, to you know, we don't have standards now because we're in that chaotic stage of, of development and um, haven't yet run up against the severe issues. But you and the other users of the printers, as they start to say, hey, you know, I can't do what I want because there are too many um, things, you know, then you get the push towards standards and they can step in and then the content gets negotiated. It's something to keep in mind here too is that the st even developing baselines is a complex process because there are very different kinds of 3D printers. The inkjet printer is different from the uh, uh, the plastic extruding printer, the uh, the laser sintering machine is uh, is very different. So that it's really establishing standards for different types of machines. I do. Uh, I'll do one more question because it's getting oh, the other side here. Thank you, uh, Jonathan Bear OSHA. Uh, I was wondering. There, there's two ways in which you can utilize this uh, from the manufacturing end point or uh, people who are making the printers. Uh, the companies can make the printers and make the materials for the printing, or you can have the printer makers and then a third party that supplies the materials. And I was wondering currently, what's the more popular model and uh, how do you see that changing over time? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh. I mean, this machine right here, basically, you know, we bought the machine and the materials we got from other places. So there's a company that makes epoxies for, for 3D printers, um, and, and we bought those from a separate company. Uh, some of the machines that are using just, just uh, plastic fibers, uh, some of those, I imagine, uh, you might be able to get them from the company, but I don't know whether they're outsourced yeah. to somebody else. Yeah. So it's a good question about kind of to what extent this is vertically integrated. Um, you know, I sell the machine, I sell the, the plastics, I control the whole system, or whether I have to, I have a supply chain that I have to deal with. There's the machine and there's the suppliers of the materials. This machine, because I, I, there's lots of options of what I can put into an extruder like this, uh, I can go to lots of different suppliers. Um, so this machine sort of lends itself uh, to sort of, you know, picking and choosing different suppliers of different kinds of plastics or, or extrudable things because it's not sold as a system, whereas some of these systems, like the ones you're, you see at Staples now, it's really sold as a system. You buy the printer, and here's the car, you know, classic you know, cartridge is. Here's the cartridge it plugs in, right? And we want you, we're giving, almost giving you the printer, so you keep buying the cartridge, right? Uh, so this is a little bit different. Um, at, the, at the industrial level, there's more integration uh, than at this consumer level where you're buying plastics. I think, you know, we've gone, way over time here, but I think people are, are welcome to sort of hang around. Um, we'll be here for a few more minutes. And I'd, I'd like to suggest a new industry. <laughs> okay. Uh, Good I way to end it. I see an industry that would take the basic uh, material. I see an industry that would be, take the basic materials, whether they be ceramics or uh, uh, acrylics or fiberglass or whatever. And it would be a machine, not much bigger than that, or maybe huge, that would take these old materials and reduce it down to uh, a pig. What I'm reminded of is when I was a child, I worked in a printing plant, <clears throat> and my job was to collect all the metal, put it in a pot, melt it down into a pig, and then we could reap, use that pig, which was a uh, solid uh, lead and and produce all kinds of uh, typefaces, uh, plates, uh, uh, prints, and it was the same kind of logic. We just have a, a newer version of that for a